Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Real Guitar Success Live. I'm Thomas Michaud and my co-host, Ami Field. Hello. And in the background, we got Felix hiding back there with all the tech stuff. <laughs> Today, we're going to start off with a training, as usual. We do this every week. And then I'm going to answer your questions. Please go ahead and add your questions while I'm talking. And if something's like really pertinent to what I'm talking about, Ami will chime in with and let me know. But otherwise, I'll wait until after the training and then go and answer each of your questions. Please, anything's fair game. And I'll do my best to translate what you say as best as you can. Try to be specific so I can help you the best I can. Mm -hmm. Then at the very end, for my students, we're going to do a raffle. And what happens is each month, if they complete a set of 20 lessons in the practice plan, they're entered into a raffle for a this week. $50 what? Amazon gift card. That's generous. We upped it from 25 to 50 nice. So that'll make it a little more exciting. So let's get started. I'm going to describe this training as the five secrets to tackling a difficult chord, we'll say. And I'm going to use the B chord because for a lot of people, uh, students, that is where they really have a hard time, mm -hmm. the B chord. Because there's no easy way to play the B chord with just the regular open strings. Mm -hmm. The first one that usually people encounter is the F chord. But the B chord, there's elements in the B chord that I can apply to other chords mm -hmm. indefinitely. So first of all, let me just describe the basic uh, forms of the B chord that you could use. Cool. First of all, there's this simple B chord. This only uses the four strings of the guitar. Mm -hmm. Then there's a version where you put your first finger over and make a bass note. That's the B bass note. With this one, there's no really good bass note. This one. Mm. Now when you do this, this high E doesn't belong, so you kind of have to deaden it out. I'm deadening it so you don't hear it now. Otherwise, it's kind of dissonant. Kind of pretty. I want to lower so folks can see you a little bit. Oh, right. okay. There we go. Better? Probably so, yeah. I was trying to get it so you could see Yeah, that. no worries. <laughs> okay, and then there's a bar version. Those I'll call kind of one and the same between this one and this one. Once you get into the bar version, this is a common one. And this one on electric guitar is probably the go-to. It was for me when I played a lot of electric guitar. But for a lot of students, it makes good sense to start with this one. First of all, it's easier, and it's using techniques that can be applied to other chords in the future. Got it. So we'll come to that. I'll, I'll help you finger it in a minute. Cool. Five concepts I want to explain first before we get into some practical stuff and actually working on the chord itself. The first one is, and this is an issue that I, I get students at my music school all the time, and they come to me and they've been playing for a little while and they say, well, I can't play this chord. I went to play a song, use this chord, and I can't play it. I've tried it and it just doesn't work. Really, you need to prepare ahead of time for the difficult chords. And when you need a chord in a song, it's already too late. You're not going to play that song if it's a difficult chord. Mm -hmm. The thing is to prepare ahead of time, and with that mentality, it's much less stressful. The stress comes from, oh, I need to do it right now. I tried a couple of times and I can't do it. Something's wrong with me. I can't do this. I can't play this song or this chord. I'm out. No. You start ahead of time. Hey, the B chord is going to be a problem. The F chord is uh, more difficult than these regular open D chords. I start weeks ahead of when I expect to actually be able to play the F chord, practice it, and then when a song comes along, even if it's not perfect or I need to brush up, I'm way ahead of the game. The second secret, I'll say, or the second concept, is start with the easier version. Don't start off with the most complicated version. In this case, I'll say the B chord, we'll start with this version. For two reasons. One is it mentally, it will give you a sense of accomplishment much quicker than if you're just trying to do a more complicated version. There's a, a long time before you'll be able to do it cleanly. But secondly, the simpler versions of the chords often are a stepping stone to more complex versions. So by learning the simpler version, you get something you can use now and it'll be easier to get the more complex versions. Third secret. That was good. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, practice using exercises, not songs. Hmm. I would. I totally would not have thought of that. Here's the thing. 
And I'm not saying don't practice songs. Don't rely on songs to get good. You've got the song and the, let's say the B chord. It comes up twice in the song. You play through the whole song. You get to the B chord, you can't do it. Now you go on one more time, you can't do it. Now you just spent two, three minutes playing the whole song right. to play a B chord that you can't do. So you start over. Another three minutes to get to the B chord. Maybe it's a little better, okay, probably not, two or three times. Mm -hmm. Three more minutes have gone by, six minutes. Three times on the song, nine minutes. Ten minutes you just spent on the song and you probably haven't gotten that B chord. You've worked on it six times in ten minutes. Yeah. Now think of an exercise that you play the B chord mm -hmm. and you do it in a way that you're, let's say a simple exercise, you're just playing the B chord every measure. In that same three minutes, you could have played the B chord 30 times. That's true. 40 times. And worked on the fingering each time. Mm -hmm. Seeing the mistake very quickly that you made the first time, what didn't work, and tried to correct it, tried to fix it. Do that for five minutes a day, not 10, right. five minutes a day, and you're gonna make progress with a lot less stress and knock on your self esteem. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because how many times are you gonna go through a song and not get it and feel bad about it? Mm -hmm. Pretty soon it's really gonna wear on you. Yeah, definitely. So do exercises first, especially ahead of time. Play them in the song, go back to your exercise, play them in the song. And I'll show you some exercise today, actually. I'll show you some for the B chord, but the concepts you can apply to learning any chord, simple or complex. And it's an idea that you can carry through for years, even when you become a professional guitar player. So the next secret, the four, practice for short periods. Don't sit there for an hour trying to work on one difficult chord. Not that many people would, but they'd try and they feel frustrated they didn't do it or they didn't get it. No, come back at little at a time. I'd recommend five minutes a day on a new chord. Mm -hmm. And no, I meant five minutes a session because you can do several times a day at five minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do some, one in the morning, one midday and one night. Yeah. And you're coming back at it with a new attitude each time. And do that every day just for a little bit at a time. Finally, Number five, go easy on yourself. This is an aspect that can uh, play into all guitar playing. To start by going easy on, if you play a song and you can't do a chord, realize that you're trying to do something that most people can't do. There are a few exceptions, but most people, it's sort of like going up to a 12 foot fence, trying to jump over it, and then after three or four tries realizing you're not gonna be able to do it, something's wrong with me. Uh, I, I, I just can't learn fast. No, you're trying something unreasonable. Now, if you had a ladder and you took it one step at a time, you'd be able to get over that fence and you do it methodically. Same with learning guitar in general and certainly practicing a difficult chord. Take it a step at a time, back up and be realistic with your expectations. Don't beat yourself up over something that probably nobody would be able to do first dozen times around. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it doesn't help. When you feel yourself really getting discouraged, just put it down and come back at it later. Don't put it down, give it up. That's a sure road to failure. No. Put it down <laughs> and then come back at it later. Yeah. And know that everybody, by just keeping at it, pretty much anybody can do this. It's just persistence. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's do some specific exercises. Here's some example ones you could use if you're working on the B chord mm -hmm. and there are also examples or models that you could use to work on any other chord. Let's start with, hmm, first of all what I'm doing is breaking down what is the difficulty in the B chord. Well in this simple version of the B chord the first difficulty I found students have is getting the three fingers together on the whatever fret. So it, all three fingers, the second, third, and pinky need to get together on one of the frets. So in the case of the B, it's the fourth fret. But I'm not gonna stop there. We're gonna do an exercise that basically just practices that. And I've also found if students put their fingers on there and strum it, one of the notes, if not several, don't quite sound right, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. So here's what I developed, an exercise like this. I'll show it to you first. We'll put the three fingers together on starting on the third fret. Don't worry about the B chord now. We're practicing just the technique. Mm -hmm. And then play starting on the fourth string, one note at a time. Good, yours sound good. Mm -hmm. So here's the whole exercise. Mm -hmm. 
So that was supposed to be muted. What I'm doing is I'm holding my fingers there, pushing them down as I strike, and then releasing them. Oh. And then the next string, and then release. So it, the effect is it mutes the string, but the practicality of it, you don't have to hold your fingers down there the whole time and get sore and oh. want to quit. So it gives you a chance to kind of make the motion for each of the notes. So here's the pattern. Back, three, four, three, two. So it's four, three, two, three, four, three, two. Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. Ready, go. Four, three, two, three, four, three, two. So she caught right away, but for everybody, I'm talking strings. Fourth string, third string, second string. Now, why stop there? Move it up a fret and do the same thing. Again, we're not worrying about what chord this is. Mm -hmm. Ready, go. Good, up a fret. Five now, five fret. Mm -hmm. Ready, go. Four, three, two, three, four, three, two. Up a fret. Ready, go. Four, fret, seven fret. Ready, go. That <laughs> action is high up there. We'll stop there, but depending on where you're at, if you really, um, for whatever reason you want to really push this, you can do it all the way back down to the third fret, mm -hmm. or if you're really an overachiever, you can go up higher than that and then come back down as well. But if uh, Really, just going up the center and doing that a little in small sessions several times, you'll make exceptional progress. And you'll be ready for the next exercise, which I'm going to show you now. Cool. The next exercise adds back in that first finger. Otherwise, it's very similar. We're not going to move up and down. It looks like this, but it'll make more sense now that we did that exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm playing each of these strings. Now, I'm not muting this time. Mm -hmm. Same pattern, though. Except, after I finish the pattern, I go to the first string, open, and then put the finger down, mm -hmm. and then open, and then go back down the strings. So the pattern is like this, listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. One, two, ready, hit it. Four, three, two, three, four, three, two, one, open, first finger down, back open, and the second finger, string, string, string. Ah, got it, got very it, got good, it. excellent. I have a question for you. Yes. When you're, when you're doing that one, one thing I struggle with is making sure that my pinky and other fingers aren't blocking that fourth fret so that you can't hear the note on the second fret. That's a common issue, mm -hmm. and that's a good question. The, you have to experiment and move your fingers around, but I'll tell you where to look. Mm -hmm. It's a small movement, so it's not something you can see, obviously. The biggest issue is if the hand is, the elbow is up here, uh -huh. the hand collapses in on the other strings and mutes it out. Got it. So let your elbow hang, stay close to your body, and push the fingers out a little bit so they have to come out and back down. Oh. Not an exaggerated to out here, that's just one word. But more out here will get you more arc, and that arc, watch, I pull my elbow in, because my first, my pinky is touching the string. Now Got I just, it. see it's a small movement. Yeah. And this applies to all chords, it, even the uh, simple um, A chord. Having that same problem. Mm -hmm. Push my hand out a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing is too, um, watch that you're cl as close to the frets as you can get, as you can get, because you'll notice the second finger cannot get very close compared to the pinky. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is make sure your nails are short. I know. <laughs> this one right here. <laughs> because when you try to press down with a nail, if the nail hits the string first, you can't press, make a solid contact. And that's just a left hand, by the way. I have long nails in the right hand for finger picking. Right. Okay, so good question. Thank the, you. the exercise. Now, here's the whole exercise. And I, by the way, I've written out these exercises for you, 
and I want to give them to you. I'll give you a link when this is done and you can go to that link and download the exercises as well as I'll put the tips on there and the chord forms. So you'll have that and it'll be much easier to remember what we did. Here we go. So here's the whole exercise. Let me do it first. Yeah. Then I move the whole thing up one fret and down one fret. Repeat that. And then the last part, same as first. Almost. <laughs> Except the end note. I move over and hit the B bass note. Okay. Preparing for the more complex B chord. Okay. So, um, I'm going to leave that uh, for now. We don't have to do cool. it. Are we ready for the third exercise? Oh, that's, we have more? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now the third exercise kind of puts it all together. Mm -hmm. We're going to start on the, putting the three fingers together, but on the seventh fret this time. Okay. Seven. All right. And the first finger goes down on the first string, fifth fret. Got so it. you're making a movable B chord form. What I mean by that is, it's the same form as the B chord, but because it's movable, it's not a B anymore, I've turned it into a D. Look at this. It's going to be a D chord here, a C chord here, a B chord here, a B flat here. That's another chord that Great. is very useful this way. And if you move it all the way down with no first finger, an A. Oh, nice. So the exercise is... got the rhythm wrong <laughs> but here's the idea you press the strings down to mute them and then lift them up oh how do you mute the lower strings and then lift your left hand up so strike and then mute so you're only you're pulsing it's like kind of like putting your pulsing the brake. If you jam the brake down, it kind of wears out your brake pads and sometimes locks the tires. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your fingers. It locks your fingers and wears them out. Mm -hmm. So this way, by pressing it down and then releasing it, it allows you to not to conserve your energy and strength in your fingers. Then do the same thing down on the third. Well, it's the third fret here, but it's the fifth fret here. That's a C chord. And then mute. Again. And same thing down on the third fret. That makes a B flat chord, by the way. Ready, go. And then we'll finish it up with an A chord, one fret down. So this makes what I call a descending progression. The chords are going down from D, C, B flat to A. Listen for a minute. It, it makes a sound that you recognize. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Cool. So start with a very simple strum and I'll on the sheet, I'll give you another simple strum, but it doesn't really matter. All I'm after is that you practice the form and you do it by pressing and then releasing. So you mute them and you can, you can do that in any strum pattern that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, those are the three exercises. Again, I'll put a link so that you can find the sheets and download them. And if you're a member of Real Guitar Success, those will also be within the membership site as well. Any start. questions? Yes. Tons Ask of me a question. question. Anything. Okay. Let's start with the with the live folks. They have a couple of questions for Go you. Go for it. All live right. is good. So we have Anna. Um, Anna says, Hi, Hi guys. Anna. Thanks for helping us with the guitar and for your encouragement. My pleasure. You're so welcome. Um, I really need it as my attempts to make bar chords are failing miserably. Any, <laughs> any tips? Yeah. Well, first of all, know that you're not alone. This is... Certainly one of the major roadblocks. If I were to pick five, this is somewhere around two or three for people. Uh, first ones are like the F chord, even trying to do a partial bar. The thing with the bar chord is, and it's very applicable to what we just did, the five secrets. 
you start with preparing and break it down to smaller steps. I have a whole system in my Real Guitar Success course called Bar Chord Boot Camp. And what I do is I start with just exercises like this one, uh, a bar chord exercise. Just make a bar over. And first of all, do this pulsating thing. And then move it up a fret and make a bar. And do that a little bit each day. Third fret. I'd say go up to seventh, maybe ninth fret, and go back and forth. Do that for three to five minutes a day for a week or two. Don't start out with trying to do a full bar chord and say, oh, I'll never get that. Now you've strengthened your bar finger doing this exercise. Here's the second exercise that I teach. So you could do these together in the same uh, practice session, or you can do one and then move to the other one. This one I really like. You make the bar. And then you go through one string at a time and press down the finger just to see how each string sounds. And then go back. And then move up a fret. This is the same concept as the exercises I just taught, is you're not going to get tired so easy, so you can do it easier for more time each session. Here's a little tip along the way. As you do this exercise, name the low sixth string the note. Name the note on the low sixth string. That sounds better because that's going to prepare you for memorizing the names of the bar chords. Here's an example. This is an F note right there. This is an F sharp. Uh, remember, by the way, there's half steps or only one fret between B and C and E and F. B and C and E and F, remember that. So when I get to A, A sharp, B, it's not going to go B sharp, it's going to go to C. That's one place. Same with open E, only one fret to F. Now, I know that's an F note, F sharp, G. I practice it for three or four days now. I remember that. I go to make the bar chord. That's an F major bar chord. Up a half step. Now it's an F sharp bar chord. G. Oh, I know the names easily because you practice the names of the notes mm -hmm. as you did this exercise. That's cool. So then I have some more exercises, but certainly you'd want to start with those two. And then I would go to some more exercises where you actually add the whole chord. And I'll give you another tip, by the way. A lot of people start bar chords because they need the F chord. That's one of the hardest bar chords to make. Mm -hmm. Because of where it is, it takes a lot of muscle power to, to press down the string right here close to that nut. It's easier to do an exercise where the bar chord's up in here and then move it back down as your hand gets stronger. Mm, that's a good tip. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So bar chord boot camp if you're a member of Real Guitar Success. Cool. And I highly recommend it because it'll prepare you for bar chords before you actually need them. Awesome. Okay. Good question. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, we have, I think it's Lady Della or LDY Della. Um, says, are there any chords you'd recommend to study for improv playing? I want to create my own melodies. Hmm. Let's see. Do you have any ideas on that one? And my first thought is, gee, every chord is good for every improv. Every chord is good for improv. My recommendation would be to start with a simple like one, four, five progression. Oh, that's a good point. Um, I would say so. I teach and play ukulele, so it's a little bit different than guitar. There are some chords that are just. Oh yeah, she's here. just not a pretty face. In case you got, anybody thought that. <laughs> that too. <laughs> So um, what I typically recommend my students do are use the chords C, F, and G7. Um, it's just, it's a really easy and, you know, some variation of that. So you may do C, F, and G with an A minor or something along those lines. Um, it's a really great chord progression that's really common. And if you're able to kind of hear that and create a progression that you like, you can find where the scales kind of intermingle and find melodies throughout there. So I want to expand a little on what she said. First of all, what I got right away is she's describing something that's a common chord progression. There are common progressions in music. And probably the first one you should learn is what we call a 1-4-5. Mm -hmm. A 1-4-5, talking about a scale, if the scale, the first chord in the scale, you have a C scale, the first chord is C, that's a one chord, and you count up. Every, every note gets a number and a chord gets built on that note. The first chord is one, the fourth chord in the C would be F, and the fifth chord would be G. That's a very common progression and can apply to any key. You just start wherever you are. If it was G, the one would be G, then you'd count up G, A, B, C would be four, and then C, D would be five. 
So a 1-4-5 progression, C, F, and G, would be a, a good one to learn to improvise over because it's a sound we're all familiar with and, and is going to be used more often. Then practice a scale, you if you want to improvise, with that chord, mm -hmm. that chord progression. Probably a good one to start with if you're in the area of folk pop would be a C scale, huh? Mm -hmm. If... Uh, if I were doing blues or rock, I'd probably choose a pentatonic that would work. C wouldn't be the first chord progression I'd use in, in blues or rock either. Yeah, no. I'd, I'd go with an A or an E probably. Yeah, I was going to say would, A or E. That would be more appropriate for blues and rock. But yeah. just learning, I, I think a C is a good place to start and play a C scale. The way I learned to improvise, uh, or I got a lot better at improvising, I should say, was I would record myself Back in my day, it was on a tape recorder. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Laughing, I get it. <laughs> and then I would play the progression, and then I would play it back on my tape player. I'd hook it up to my stereo so it was loud, and I'd play over it. So this would be going on. It's like two people, and I'd say... And I'd be playing along with the chord progression. I'd do that every day for a little bit, and I kept getting better. I'd find things I liked, I didn't like, I'd do them over. Then I'd try a new chord progression, and so on and so on. Uh, eventually, I got to where I could play with other people, and you know, then it really goes faster when you're playing with other people who play for longer hours. Yeah, for sure. And that, I think that playing with others, too, in general, kind of gets your creative juices flowing a little yeah. bit. So even if you're able to hang for a little while just getting some basic chords down, yeah. once you'll hear other people kind of express m melodic phrases and stuff, it'll inspire you to come up with some as well. I learned a lot by trying to copy what I heard somebody else do when yeah. we were jamming. I think my biggest tip when it comes to that is don't be afraid. I know that was something that was scary for me. When I was first learning how to improvise on any instrument, I was like so scared that I was going to play a wrong note that I just didn't want to play any notes. So I tried, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And then I would go jam and... <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Freeze. Um, I should uh, come up with a lesson sometime on how to progressively work on... Yeah. Not being afraid. Yeah. Do you have any tips on that? Uh, it's, well, it's easier said than done. We'll start there. <laughs> um, I think that one thing that was a big help for me was um, practicing improvising. Like, just put it, like, l literally, I just put on the radio. And whatever song came next, I'd use my ear to try and find the key and play notes that worked and find notes that didn't work. And then the notes that did work, I'd actually jot down on a little piece of paper really quickly. Wow. And then just work that's cool you know practice going back and forth on those like five notes that i found that happened to work with the song um and so that's kind of what helped build my confidence so the more that i would do that at home then once i was around other people i was like eventually your ear gets trained enough where you can hear it and you're like oh i can figure out those notes and then also when you play a wrong note or something that doesn't fit just use it to go into the right one it's really a lot so, easier on the like, guitar. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I did uh, something similar to that, but I, I, it took me a long time to be able to write notes on paper. Mm -hmm. I would, like if I got a cool phrase, I'd record it so I could try it. I could play it back and do it again later. Yeah. I guess my ears work better than my kind of that connection to writing on music. I'm better now, but yeah. still my go-to is when I have a melody or something, I'll record it. Yeah, It takes definitely. me too long to write it out. Yeah, I hear that. Cool. Well, we actually have a couple of other ah, questions. More questions. Yes. Um, let's see. So Nicholas just wanted to quickly clarify. So B is a fifth string chord. I think is is B is a fifth string chord. Yeah, I think this was back when we were talking about. Um, I think it's referring to bar chords. Bar huh? chords. Yes. So what what um, Nicholas is referring to? I'll have to catch everybody up first is that there are two main types of bar chords. Ones that get the name of the note from the sixth string, which is what I described with the bar chord exercise, and then ones that get the name from the fifth string. A good exercise as you progress is to do that bar chord exercise with names of the notes on the sixth string, and then do the same thing with names of the notes on the fifth string so you're prepared both ways. So the B chord gets its name on the fifth string. So if I made a B bar chord, I'll do my usual electric guitar version, the name of the chord is right there. If I made a B minor, it's still a B, that's a minor form, but the name is B minor because it's a minor chord. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yes, 
In short, yes, it is a fifth, I call them fifth string root bar chord. Fifth string root bar chord, because the root or the name of the chord is on the fifth string. Got it. Cool. Um, Cornelius actually had two quick questions. One, can you please explain what the Roman numbers stand for? And then he went on to say, uh, when you play a scale, you come across one Roman number and goes to two Roman number like halfway through. Sure. I, I just did a whole lesson actually, so I'm, 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 up, I'm up on that, uh, explaining that. Yeah. Um, in Real Guitar Success, I'm doing a series of theory lessons, and one of them is the Roman numbers. Mm -hmm. The Roman numbers are used to designate usually chords in within a key. So the Roman numerals go from one to seven, really. We don't have eight because eight's just a repeat of the first one. And the Roman numerals, you could just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But there's a little confusion there because when you see a, I'll call it an Arabic number, that's the regular, what we know as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When you see that, you can't really tell, or if somebody says that, if they're talking about the intervals within a chord, because you could say uh, one to three, and that's an interval from one to three, or if they're talking about a chord, the first chord in a scale, or the second chord. We use the Roman numerals, because as soon as you see that, you know they're talking about the first chord in the key. Roman numeral two, mean, two means the second chord in the key. Roman numeral three means the third chord. Mm -hmm. And then when you see one, four, five, you know right away that's a chord progression, one, four, mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. By the way, Roman numerals, we have small Roman numerals and big Roman numerals. The big Roman numerals, I don't know if you remember from grade school, is there's like the big capital V and the big capital I. And little Roman numerals, we use little I's and little V's. When you see little I's and little V's, that means it's a minor chord most of the time. And when you see big I and big V's, V's for five, it's major chord. Now, if we have, uh, if something's like a seventh chord or something like that, we'll add numbers to it. And if it's diminished chord, you'll see minor with a little zero, which means diminished. Did I answer that question well enough? Did you have anything to add? Mm, no, I think that that's a pretty clear explanation. That makes sense. Now, there's yeah. a lot more to what Roman numerals, learning about what each of the scales degree are in a major scale, the, in a minor scale, and so on, what chords fall, and that's that's a, a more, uh, that's a longer discussion, and probably something that should be taken in bite-sized pieces progressively. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Which I do, and real guitar success. Yeah, cool. Uh, we have a couple other questions. Um, so somebody was saying, can I, I can play downstrokes with guitar pick, but can't do upstrokes properly. Any suggestions in which position should be hand or angle of the guitar pick? Yes. Um, I'll take a, a simple G chord. When you're strumming, first of all, as you go down, pick should be angled up a little bit. Otherwise it tends to stick in the string if you're going down, something like that, which you might want someday. I do that when I do a rig strum. deliberately turning my pick even a little down to dig into the string. But normally for a brush strum, you want to go pick up on the way down and opposite, you flick your wrist a little bit, pick aiming down as you go up. And just a little, it's not like this. It's a little twist like this. And see, I, I don't even think about it. As I go down, my, my wrist is turning slightly and then it's ready for the up. So the motion is the arms going up and down and my wrist is turning like this. And if this is difficult, I would simplify this to just a down up and practice it a little each day, trying to get a smooth sound. And that's what will happen if, if your pick is not in the right place, it'll get rough. Here's another thing, and I'll call this a little more advanced tip. When I hold my pick, I'm putting it on my first knuckle, my first finger, and then a thumb over it. I'm aiming it a little bit into the guitar, but I'm also pressing a little harder, slightly harder on the back of the pick than the front with my thumb. So what's happening, it allows my pick to wobble without flying out of my hand. So that gives me a little extra cushion without having to turn as much. That takes some practice, but if you put your attention there, it's something that you'll get over time. Yeah, definitely. That's a great one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have two other ones that just came in. Um, so Nomi Dwayne says, 
when learning bar chords, is there a maximum amount of time per day one should practice? Not uh, absolutely, huh? But it depends on your level and it depends on your uh, ability to uh, muscle-wise to endure because it does wear on you, especially at first. A lot of people even uh, get problems from you know pressing the guitar too hard for a long period of yeah, time. For sure. Probably that's rare because really most people give up too soon. <laughs> to, I would say the maximum amount of time is the time where you're starting to feel some strain and discomfort then stop and rest and come back at it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be wait until the next day. You could do that same kind of thing mm -hmm. for a few minutes, several times a day if you want. If you're working on something small, if you're working on a new technique or a new chord or bar chords like that, you can do it several times a day in small, short sessions. That tends to work better than a long session, getting tired and everything start getting a little bit sloppy. I know in the beginning, most of my students cannot do work on a bar chord exercise or anything more than five minutes in a, at a session. Mm -hmm. Later on, when they're doing more complex bar chords, because there's more variety and their hands are stronger, they can do 10, 15 minutes on just that aspect. Yeah. What's your experience with that? Um, I'd say, yeah, what you're saying is pretty much in line with what I recommend. It's a little different on oop because obviously the neck is way smaller. Yeah, it's a little easier on um, the hands. Huh? Yeah, the way I think of it too, I mean, these are muscles. You know, these are muscles in your hand. The reason it's uncomfortable is you got ligaments and bones and muscles and all that. Um, so I agree that taking breaks is important. Um, and I think that also sandwiching bar chords between chords that you know when coming up with exercises is actually really useful. That's a good point. Um, because, you know, if you're able to go from, well, let's say like a D chord on the guitar, right, which is the same as G on the ukulele, if you're able to go from that into a bar chord, um, you're kind of training your fingers how to get in and out of the bar chord in addition to giving yourself a little break you know so if you have a progression with four or five chords and only one of them is a bar chord um, then you can go over that a couple of times that's a nice way to kind of sneak the practice in there that makes um, sense. when you're taking a break from just like clocking your way up the neck i actually have some exercises on youtube uh, or a video i should say on going with from bar chord to open chord mm -hmm. i forgot the name of it but if i see it i'll put it in the notes later on cool and you can always search if you're in a hurry something that's like how, uh, changing from bar chord to open chord mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question um i do have rv asks can you suggest how to hold a shaped bar chord properly it's easy to hold E-shaped bar chord, but A-type <laughs> is very difficult. So that's basically what we were doing. I'll explain. What he's describing as A-shaped bar chord is basically an A chord moved up with a bar. So that's exactly what we did in that first exercise. The B chord is an A-shaped bar chord. If I make a bar, it's a B chord, but it's the A shape. It starts from the A shape. A up two frets to B with a bar. So do all the exercises that we did in the first of this video, and I'd really recommend you go ahead and download those. Give me a day or so to, to get them up in the, um, on the website, and I'll put a link there. Yeah. Um, Phil just also wanted to add, Hi, Thomas. I had a similar problem Hi, Phil. Uh, with pick and strum. I went down to a really thin pick, got used to that bendy one, then went to a bit thicker, yeah. then a bit more. Eventually, all good. Add monster grip. Yeah, good. That's exactly what I would do. If you're starting out, get a good strum. Start with a thin pick because it's hard to get the technique. Then as you get good at it, move up. The reason you might want to go up to a heavier pick, and I do often use an actual thick pick, is because when you go to melody or something where you're picking bass notes, it gives you a better, fuller sound, and it's easier to play faster. When you have a thin pick, it's bending, and it's hard to get back when you're playing a melody. It's hard to recover the pick in time to play another note. So... As you push up to a heavier pick, you have to have good technique to get a smooth strum. Definitely. Uh, cool. I have a couple more questions. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, questions are good. Questions are good. So a couple of these are from some RGS members that sent in beforehand. Uh, Gregory was asking how to use a scale and a chord progression. Hmm. So I'm not sure exactly what Gregory... Uh, hi, Gregory, by the way. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. But I'm going to assume, and I hope I'm right, but if I'm not, you know, uh, please feel free to ask the question again and I'll answer it again in another show. Um, how to use scales to improvise over chords. And I'll answer that. There's two schools of thought. 
they're both valid. It's not like one excludes the other. One is kind of the rock blues way of playing. You pick, you have a scale that goes over a chord progression. You play that same scale. An example would be a 12 bar blues pattern. I would play, if I were playing an A, I would play a, um, a minor pentatonic scale. And I'd play that over the whole progression. Another school of thought is more of a jazz school, is you change scales based on the chord progression. In other words, as you change to a new chord, it's a new scale degree. This ventures in that whole area of um, uh, modes, learning many different scales and modes and playing different modes over different scales. This is something I'm not an expert on. I have some experience, but and I integrate it, kind of push it into my, my improvising when I play, but mm -hmm. Uh, people who are good at that, they really spend a lot of time practicing in their modes and, and playing over chord progressions and thinking, oh, I'm in a G chord and I'm going to go into a, a, a G, I, uh, G, not Lydian, but uh, a different G mode. What's mm -hmm. the five uh, uh, mode? Mixolydian. Mixolydian. Yeah, Mixolydian scale. Uh, I'll use the G Mixolydian scale over that G chord and then go back into a Ionian mode. Mm -hmm. Should I say Ionian mode when I get to the one chord or the... Uh, one chord of the key, so on. That would be C in the key. Yeah. C, D, E, F, G. G would be the five. Key, C. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of theory stuff, huh? Anyway, not my specialty, but that's the basic idea. I would, if you're just starting out improvising, I would pick uh, on guitar, I would start with the A, do a progression in A, a simple progression that would be A, D, and E, and play an A minor pentatonic scale over it. It would sound like bluesy rock and you could hardly hit any wrong notes. Matter of yeah. fact, if you hit a wrong note, we'll call it a blues scale. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura had a question, and then RV had one more question, and I have a couple more coming in. Uh, so Laura was asking or saying, when I'm finger picking, my fingers seem to trip all over each other. Help, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the club. <laughs> That's what I said. I said, you're not alone. <laughs> the biggest problem is you're you're trying to do something that's too hard. Uh, in other words, you jump steps, you've skipped levels. <laughs> and then this, really, you're in good company. S go back and work on basic finger picking patterns to start with. Here's one simple pattern. Make a chord, hit the bass note. I'm a G chord, so I'm gonna hit the G bass note, and then pick and get it even. Now, add another chord. I'm going to the C because that fits good with G. Bass note. And now do an exercise where you move from one to the other. C. I'm doing each one twice. And notice I'm keeping in time. I'm not stopping between each chord. So this is just one of many simple exercises. I just picked one to give you as an example and you could use it. If this one is hard and you can't do this, stop and do one each chord at a time until you can do each chord and then practice moving from the other. Don't go to this till you can do at least 80-90% of the time this smoothly. If you're trying to do something more complicated with Travis picking or something like that, you skip steps and you're not only going to be frustrated, but you're going to create some bad habits because you're tensing up trying to do something you're not ready for. Yeah. Patience, step by step. Get some lessons. <laughs> Get somebody to tell you what the next thing, next thing. Or at least you look at my basic finger picking videos and see which exercise would be appropriate for you. Yeah. On YouTube, just... Type in Thomas Michel finger picking. Yeah. Um, RV had another question, and I think I can tackle this one. Go Maybe for it. My alley. Um, RV says, how do I strum and sing at the same time? When I sing, my strumming goes out of beat, like in a wonder wall, while intro, it's all good. As soon as it starts to sing, I can't focus on my right hand. Okay, so been there, done that. I also can't play guitar to save my life, but um, here's what I do with my OOC students. It's most of my students who come to me um, really just want to be able to strum and sing. Like yeah. that's what ukulele is Makes really popular to do. So I've developed a couple of exercises that you can use to help you start with that. Here's my recommendation. You start with a very simple strum. So like this. Okay, 
so I'm just strumming down, right? Now I'm going to say my ABCs while I do this. So, okay. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, rest, H, I, right? Okay, you get the point. So you keep doing that. Then from there, you, come, you make your strum a little more complex. I take it you're not really worrying about the notes. No, you're just don't worry about just the trying notes. to coordinate using your mouth and the, the you can rhythm. Even, That's you, clever. You can I, even I never mute. thought of that. You can even mute. A, B, e, C, B, e, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, That's L, great. N, O, P. Whatever you want to do. Make so a lesson on this. You could. This yeah, is great. We totally could. So what you start with is, like I said, just a simple down strum. You don't have to play a chord. You can just do this. Start with your ABCs. And then you can start singing other songs. So, you know, whatever song you wanted to sing. Um, Never mind, I'll find someone like you. And you can just do whatever you want. Yeah, you're, you're right not worried about the, yep. trying to get the melody just exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the first key is to just get used to having your right hand becoming independent. So that's, those are my tips on that. Really nice. Yeah, thank you. I think we should. We should make a lesson. Okay. Oh, sorry. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Cool. Next question. Yeah, next question. We have... Uh, Michael, let me get to Michael's question here. Uh, Michael says, hello, any tips on posture and holding the neck to be able to comfortably form chords? Uh, I do, actually, a lot. Let me think of the most helpful that we can do uh, within a reasonable period of time. Um, now, it depends on your standing or sitting, of course. I'm going to tackle sitting to start with, but standing is a, is a real thing. Mm. First of all... Um, I, got, I had a lot of problems, I'll tell you, right from the beginning. I played for many, many hours, uh, sometimes even six to eight hours a day, and I would slump. That caused me a lot of problem. I would strongly recommend that you try to watch your posture so you don't hurt yourself over time if you're practicing for a long time. Keep your guitar pretty much straight up. Now, this is hard for students because they want to look down like this. And that causes you see my back to slump right away when I'm looking down. Don't do it. Just get used to playing so that, you know, if you have to look down like that once in a while, but get used to work, feeling how the strings are gonna work. Now, the other thing is, I put my, there's many different ways to hold the guitar. I put it on my right knee most of the time, or I should say my lap, the right leg lap. Some people like it on the left like this. I find this is actually sturdier, but feels awkward for strumming for me. Mm. This is more of a classical approach. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, if I want to work on something that's a lot of finger picking, and uh, I'll actually get a footstool and raise this leg. I can't do that on this chair because I'm too far off the ground. But when I'm close to the ground, I'll get a footstool and raise this leg. The same here, this helps my back too, is I'll put a footstool on this right leg and just raise it up slightly. And that actually seems to relieve some tension in my back. The other thing is, uh, in your hand, be careful um, not to tense too much. And if you find yourself tensing, stop and relax and then come back at it. Uh, because if you tense your hands, it'll make chords harder and it also can hurt you over time. Mm -hmm. And I prefer the thumb position behind the neck or close to. It's okay, it creeps up. Some people play like this and it's not wrong. There's some great musicians that play like this. But there, it seems like if you're starting out anyway, the habit of putting your thumb back here takes a little bit longer to get, but you have more flexibility moving around, especially when it comes to bar chords. And I don't like doing this. See, this is how people play like this, they go like this, and then they have to switch everything around to play a bar chord, and then back again. When I play a bar chord, my thumb's back there. It's a much shorter movement. Anything else you can think about that that would be helpful? No, I think that you pretty much hit the nail on the head. It's really different with ukulele. Like it, when I, I totally feel awkward when I hold guitar and like this, I'm so lost. I find that this is way more comfortable for me, the left yeah. leg. But that's because uk, you play here on your I chest. I was trained in my classical guitar to hold it like yeah, that. Yeah, to do it here, to kind of like hold the guitar It is sturdier on, on, with my left hand anyway, but yeah. I have a hard time uh, strumming yeah. easily. Yeah, I could get that because it's kind of, it's awkward. You kind of have to like lean over the guitar. So yeah. What I have students do a lot of times too is I'll have them put a strap on the guitar and tighten the strap so when they're sitting down, the, the guitar just lightly hangs on my lap. 
student's lab. That way, when they stand up, it stays in exactly the same place. So it's much easier to play standing up if you've been practicing with a strap like that. Plus, it keeps the guitar from slumping down like this. You might want to try that, putting a strap on the guitar and tightening just enough, mm -hmm. not so it's off your leg. Right, but enough to kind of support it. Yeah, it's just it. slightly yeah. touching your leg, but it would stay in the same place when you stand. Yeah, good. I think we have time for one more question, okay. and then I know we have to close up for the day. Um, RV also just asked, and I just wanted to remind everyone, he asked um, how often we do this, because he's a self-taught guitarist, oh, and sometimes great. needs advice. So right now, once a month, the first Thursday of every month, mm -hmm. we'll be back again in October. Yep. And it's always the first Thursday at noon, so the date will change, but it'll be the first Thursday. Yep. Uh, cool. And then the last question that we have for today is from Mark, one of our RGS Live students, or I guess we're on RGS Live, huh? He's oh, and RGS by the way, I'm doing studio videos every Monday and Thursday, mm -hmm. except for Thursday, we do a live one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so Mark says, hello, in a 4-4 song with two chords, example C and G, if the chords split the bar, so two beats on C, two on G, I can play it with a simple down strum. How do I play a more complicated strum? with more ups and downs and still only four beats in each bar. Okay, that makes sense. Normally, especially in the beginning, I teach all the strums are one full bar, four beats. So here's a typical four beat strum. One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four. So he's asking, what if the chord changes? One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four. And that's not so hard if you're just doing straight down. One, two, three, four, but the first half of the strum is different than the second half, so it, it can be a little confusing. I think it's a great question, and I think it's a good thing for students to practice. First of all, I would start finding where the chord changes with a straight down strum, counting, counting. One, three, four, one, two. Then add a simple strum with down ups mm -hmm. and practice changing on the three that's going to be splitting the bar right in half. So exactly. that'd be like this. One, two, and a simple strum would be just down up. Three and four. One. So the strums down, down, up, down, up, down. Mm -hmm. One, two, and three, and four. So changing chords would be one, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four. So my point here is to not just intellectually think it out, Practice it so it becomes natural. Mm -hmm. When you get to that level where that's feeling pretty good, try for one of these more complex drums. Here would be one. Great strum, by the way, used a lot by like the Eagles and mm -hmm. that pop rock genre. Mm -hmm. But the three, it doesn't fall nice and neat in the middle. So it's one, two, and three, and four, and one, two, and three. The three falls in the middle of a no strum, mm -hmm. and then the next one is like another up. So I would try this. This would be a great exercise. One, two, and three, and four, and one, two, and three. I still change on three, That's but right. you don't hear it until I come up on the end of three. So it's one, and two, and three, and four. One, two, and three. Oops. One, and one. Uh, how's it going? Oh, okay. One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four, and one, two, and three, and four. If you got that, you're home free. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Um, I did have a couple more questions. Okay, I can handle it. Okay, cool. So uh, we have W Savage saying, do you have a simple warm-up exercise you favor um, most for your fingers before playing? Yes. All my students start off with this one. I do have a video on that. Look for speed developer number one. It's kind of ironic because it look you start very slow, by the way, and it'll explain that in the video. But the biggest way of getting fast on the guitar is to practice slow, accurately, and without tension because then little by little you can get faster and faster. If you start trying to go fast, tense your muscles, 
you'll be dead. You'll lock yourself up. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic speed developer. Uh, another version of that would be add the pinky. I would start without the pinky, depending on where you're at. But if you're more experienced, start getting that pinky involved. Yeah, that's a, yeah. The pinky is hard. <laughs> it does, but it's you useful. need it. Yeah, it's useful. Uh, and then, okay, the very last one for today is says, in these days, my guitar solos sound the same. I need to be more creative. How can I be more creative in these bad times? It's a cry face. I'm so sorry. That's it. You need some trauma in your life. <laughs> <laughs> some melodrama. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, there's certainly, of course, I'm sure you realize there's no one answer to that. But if I were you, I would be practicing every day by making chord progressions and and just playing what you're playing and then experiment while nobody's listening so you don't have to worry and then find out what you like and then keep working on that and then integrate that to when you jam with other people. That's the best thing. The other thing that I would do is try learning some new scales mm -hmm. and then see if you can integrate some of those notes from new scales. I, I To me, that's fun. I'll, I'll stretch and learn an exotic scale. Like I remember when I first learned the flamenco scale, which is for our ears is quite a bit different, but it really opened up my hearing. I uh, uh, used to listen to a lot of Santana, and I noticed he used a lot from the Dorian mode scale. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, by the way. It's just slightly minorish, and I integrate some of that into yeah. my playing. And that really kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone, playing the same thing over and over. Any, do you have any ideas on that? Um, no, I think also like listening to music. Oh, that's as a good point. As as that sounds, I mean, just listening to music and um, listening to all different kinds of music, I think that being versatile is really important. It doesn't mean you can't focus on one area, uh, but being open to different genres can be helpful. A game I used to play was to choose a year and then go to a globe and stop my finger on a random country and look up music from that year in that place. Hmm. Um, I don't know if people have time for that, but you know, it's a fun exercise to do. If not, just listen to a whole bunch of different kinds of music or music that you want to sound like. You know, if like if you're really into, I don't know, Led Zeppelin, for example, and you really just love the way that they make music, listen to a lot of Led Zeppelin because a lot of the stuff that you're going to be hearing will be maybe re repeated phrases that you can kind of incorporate into your own playing. I got the advice from a master improviser one time. And he told me, listen to music, cop licks from it, copy them, and then change them and make them your own. Mm -hmm. And then integrate that into your playing. Exactly. And make that a constant cycle. Yeah, definitely. He had that, yeah, I forget the terminology. I wrote a post on it one time. It was um, uh, basically he's talking a simulate and then change it and make it your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, good. I think it's time for a raffle. Okay, time for a raffle. Raffle's cool. We're giving away a $50 good Amazon price. gift card. These are for students of Real Guitar Success who have completed the practice plan for the month of August. Mm -hmm. And drum roll. See, it's going to David Muir. David Muir, congratulations. You've won the $50 Amazon gift card. And I'll be sending that to you. I'll send you an email right quick and just let you know it's on the way. In case you're not on the live call and not hearing this. Congratulations. And congratulations to all of you who completed the plan for the month. Good work. And of course, the gift card is more of a game to make it fun. But the real reward is the benefit you're getting from learning and playing and doing the exercises and forcing yourself to kind of go through the different exercises each month. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you so much for being a part of our community, for joining us. Thank you, Ami. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. Woo yeah. Woo. <laughs> We'll look forward to seeing you again next month on October, October. something on Thursday. There we go. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Bye.